Hello everyone. In this video we are going to derive the equations of motion for a shopping cart with a single caster wheel in the front in the center. So many of the cars that you see typically they have two of the caster wheels in the front but here for simplicity we assume that it's one and we assume that basically uh, the angle of the member that is holding the caster wheel uh, onto the body of the shopping cart here shown by member C the angle of that can change okay so uh, it's not uh, basically this joint here but there that is allowing the rotation and that rotation is shown here by angle Q4 and uh, we want to derive the equations of motion for this so what frames do we have what uh, rigid bodies the first rigid body is rigid body b which is the entire shopping cart and the second one is rigid body c which is this arm connecting the caster wheel to the shopping cart and this is the top view and we have three tires with centers at p3 p4 and p5 p4 and p5 are the back wheels and p3 is the caster wheel the frames we have is the end frame, which is the inertial frame here, fixed. Then we have B frame, which is attached to body B. You can see B1 is uh, in the longitudinal direction, B2 is the transverse direction, and B3 is out of the plane, the same as N3. And then we have the C frame, where again C1 is along this uh, member C, C2 is perpendicular to that, and C3 is just like B3 and N3 out of the plane. The center of mass for the cart is shown at point BO and the mass of the cart is MB. The mass for body C is shown by MC and we assume it is concentrated at point P3. Okay. And um, the moment of inertia of body B about its center is shown by IB. Then uh, the dimensions we have, the distance from the point P2 to point P1, and P1 is the middle point of the two back wheels, is shown by distance L2, the length of the shopping cart. Then uh, the distance from the centroid to point P1 is shown by L1 and the length of this arm connecting P2 to P3 for the caster wheel is L3 here okay so these are all of the parameters that are involved in uh, the uh, configuration of this rigid uh, system this system of rigid bodies okay so what degrees of freedom do we have or what ge uh, generalized coordinate basically do we have? So here we have Q4, which as I said, is the rotation of member C with respect to member B. Okay. Yeah. Then the rotation of member B with respect to the end frame is shown by coordinate Q3. And then the location of this uh, point uh, P1, right? Or the centroid, if you will, are shown what are shown with Q1 and Q2 here. So you see that Q1 and Q2 are the position vectors of the center of the wheels with respect to a fixed point in the end frame. Okay, yeah, so if we measure, the, let's say this is the center, right? So this coordinate here is like Q1 and this coordinate here is Q2. So we have four generalized coordinates. And you know right off the bat that not all of these four can be uh, independent from each other. Why? Because uh, this back side here, this set of wheels P4 and P5, has a, a non-holonomic constraint. And in this direction of B2, the cart cannot move. It can only move in the direction B1. So already out of these four generalized coordinates, uh, it's like one of them is redundant or you can say there is one constraint now could you use that constraint and get rid of one of these we'll see okay that's one thing the other thing is here the bottom of this wheel this caster wheel the bottom of this caster wheel also does not slip with respect to the ground okay 
and that uh, no motion here. So this caster will cannot also move in the C2 direction. Okay, the contact point of it, of course, right? And that one, as we'll see here later on, this uh, V of uh, P3, uh, let's see if I can find it, dot C2 equals zero. That's another what? That's another uh, constraint that we have for no slipping. So uh, really, we only need two generalized coordinates, but uh, to get rid of them or to add them as a Fafian constraint, that's something that we have to discuss in this video. What are the inputs to the system? How do you drive the system? So the user, whoever is pushing the cart at point P1, that person is going to apply a force FB1, which basically is responsible for moving the cart forward and backward, and also can apply a torque TB3, which is what which uh, can spin the shopping cart. Okay, so if you want the shopping cart to spin and also to move forward and backward, you have two inputs, FB1 and tau b one at point BP1. Remember, as I said, there are only really two degrees of freedom in the system. So these two are really uh, all the inputs that you need to have everything determined for the system. Okay, you have two DOF, so you need two inputs. So let's go ahead and derive the equations using the Keynes method. The first thing, as I said, is we have a, a non-holonomic condition, no lateral motion for the back wheels. For that reason, instead of choosing four generalized speeds, four U's, we only pick three U's. Remember here, we have four Q's. Should we pick four U's and should we make these U's to be QI dots necessarily? No. Because if you look at my previous example on my channel under uh, playlist robotics, you saw that we typically pick UI to be QI dot. But that's not necessarily something you have to do. So you can define your UI dots to be not necessarily equal to the corresponding time derivative of QI. Okay, if you want, you can pick them differently. And if you want, you can pick a different number of U's compared to the Q's to avoid these constraints. So here is exactly what we are doing. And that's one of the reasons I picked this example because this is a really beautiful example. It has so many things that is added to that previous video I did with the 2DOF planner arm. First of all, this one uh, is more complicated, right? It's a, a differential drive plus a caster wheel. So it's a different, basically, it's a mobile robot here. And uh, there is inertia term that you need to consider for rotation of member B. And there are two constraints here. So this is quite a bit complicated. And before I move further down the uh, derivations, uh, the pictures, the equations, and text, they are all taken from this paper, Keynes Equation for Haptic Display of Multi-Body Systems by R. Gillespie. Okay, this is a beautiful paper, and these material are directly coming from this paper. So basically what I'm doing is I'm uh, summarizing that paper for you here. Okay, so what U's were picked here? The first U that was picked was the speed of the cart in the forward direction. So in this direction of B1, the speed of the forward motion of the cart or backward motion is picked as U1. So you see it's V of point P1 dot B1. Project velocity of point P1 in the B1 direction, which is just the forward velocity. If you looked at my videos on differential drive, you see that this V here of a differential drive is one of the important parameters, right? The second one is what? Omega of member B in the N3 direction, U2, and that is this omega of this chassis, basically, right? That is this guy, omega of member B, of course, projected in N3 or B3 or A3. They are all the same direction. And the last one is the omega of the handle for the caster wheel, U3. So the last one is this rotation here. This is omega C, this is omega B, and this is V of P1 in the, of course, uh, B1 direction.
okay so these three are considered what are considered like u1 and u2 and u3 you see this way i can avoid adding this constraint that in this direction there is no motion so in this direction if you want a u4 that u4 is equal to zero since it's always zero it's better to not even use it at all and just go with these three u's right clearly because the way that we define q1 and q2 remember the way that we define q1 and q2 that means this point P1 and the tires attached to it can move any way they want, but the matter of fact is they can't. In this direction, this U is equal to zero. So here, by picking three U's instead of four Q's, instead of four U's, which are the derivative of them, here we are getting rid of this constraint here. We are incorporating it indirectly. Good? Yeah? So this is how we pick U's. Now, are these U's related to the Q dots? Of course they are. How? We'll find out. So how do we do it here? Let's go ahead and find these three entities that I said. We have P1, Omega, B, and Omega, C. Let's find them also in terms of the Q dots. What are they? Well, clearly, because of the definition of Q1 and Q2, velocity of point P1 is, of course, Q1 dot in N1 direction plus Q2 dot in what? N2 direction. So that is obvious. And that is equal to U in the B1 direction, right? This guy here. It's equal to U1 in the B1 direction. Yeah. Omega of member B just because the way q3 is defined which is the angle of the chassis with respect to the end frame clearly this omega is the time derivative of that q3 it's obvious so omega of b is q3 in the n3 direction or since q3 is uh, the definition of uh, q3 is u2 you can call it u2 in the n3, n3 direction and what about omega of member C? Well, omega of member C, which based on the definition is U3 and 3, is also Q3 dot plus Q4 dot. Why? Because 3 is from B to N, and Q4, if you look at it, is from C to B. So the total angle of member C with respect to the N is Q3 plus 4. So you have to take derivative of both of these when added together, and then what? That is going to be your uh, Q, your uh, U three. So you see that now my U's and the Q dots are related, but not directly with the simple relation. Okay, so uh, I just found some typos in this area, so I just fixed it. Uh, this one was cosine sine and that one and I just double checked it and this is negative sine and cosine actually So uh, if you want now you can write use in terms of Q dots or Q dots in terms of use in a matrix format So clearly u2 here is the same as uh, Q3 dot u3 is Q3 dot plus Q4 dot so that's why you get a 1 here and you get a 1 and a 1 here and then uh, you have to here write your um, U1B1. You have to write this B1 in terms of N1 and N2. And if you do so, if you just decompose this velocity, which is U1, in the direction of N1 and N2, okay, this is the B1 direction, knowing that angle is Q3, uh, you can see that U1, a cosine component of that, will be aligned N2, which is Q2 dot, and a negative sine component of that will be aligned N1, which uh, you can see here. So when you see in these equations that your Q1 dot here equals negative sine times U1 and a Q2 dot equals a cosine times U2, or the backward relations here that is coming directly from these projections okay yeah so uh, remember we said that so these are my three u's and the relations to the four q dots through this matrix 
And uh, now the next thing is, remember I said that the caster will here cannot move in the C2 direction. The caster will can move, but not in the C2 direction. There is a uh, non-slip uh, condition in the C2 direction as well. So uh, if we want to get that one, what do we do? So all we need is to find velocity of point P3, the center of the caster will, and then dot product it with the direction C2 and say that is equal to what? Equal to zero. And that is exactly what we are seeing in this equation number four. We say V of P3 dot C2 equals what? Zero. By the way, this is a scalar zero, not a vector zero. So what is V of P3? For that, we can use simple kinematics. V of P3 equals uh, V of P2 plus omega of this member p2 p3 cross the length from p2 p3 which is l3 right and omega of this member p2 p3 or member c is shown by what it is basically if you just go back and look omega of member c is this q3 dot plus q4 dot huh or in terms of u it was u3 so it is u3 in the n3 direction and the vector from p2 to p3 is this vector so if you say omega cross r and remember omega is out of the board here this omega cross r is definitely going to be in this direction right and what is the magnitude of it the magnitude of it is clearly l3 times u3 so you have to add this L3 U3 in the negative C2 direction. You have to add it to the velocity of point what? P2. Now, what is velocity of P2 itself? Since P2 belongs to member P1, P2. So velocity of this is equal to velocity of point P1, which we know we called it what? We called it basically U1, of course, in the B1 direction, right? Plus... This vector from P1 to P2, this vector here, right? And the omega of this member, which is shown by, um, if you go back, it is shown by um, U2, right? Omega of member B. So this spin here is uh, U2. And this vector, this R vector here is as you can see, length L2. So the relative velocity between P1 and P2 is in this direction. The magnitude of it is clearly L2 U2. And the direction of that is clearly what? In the uh, B2 direction. So what we need to add are three components. U1 in the B1 direction, plus L2 U2 in the B2 direction, plus what? L3, U3, but in the negative C2 direction. And that is what, that is this uh, term here that we're going to uh, place in for um, V of P3. So let's go ahead and write it. It is going to be U1 in the B1 direction plus L to u2 in the b2 direction and minus l3 u3 in the c2 direction so now you dot product that whole thing by c2 what's going to happen well c2 dot c2 is one so you're going to get negative l3 u3 which is exactly this then you have L2U2 B2 dot C2. The angle between B2 and C2 is angle 4, right? Q4. So this L2U2 has to be multiplied by cosine of Q4, which is exactly what you can see over here. And finally, you get B1 dot C2. The angle between B1 and C2 is Q4 plus 90 degrees. So cosine of that is going to be negative sine of 4 times u1 and that is negative sine 4 times u1 so this is my no slip condition for um, the caster wheel 
which if you write it, it is going to be this form. And if you look at this here, it's a linear relation between u1, u2, and u3, from which you can find u3 as a function of u1 and u2. So now what? Now, wherever you have u3 in our future equations, we can replace it with this uh, equation 4 as a function of uh, u1 and u2. This way, instead of now dealing with four u's, first we reduce it to three u's by incorporating this uh, no uh, lateral motion. Now from three u's, we can go to two u's because now u3 is found as a function of u1 and u2. So now you're only down to two ODEs only for u1 and u2. And that is exactly what we want. So you see the way that these equations are implemented here is uh, no Fafian constraint is directly implied, but basically elimination is used here. Now, not only in the future we need to replace u3, we need to replace u3 dot as well. So what we need is to take a time derivative from this equation, which if you do take a time derivative, you need to use chain rule, so be careful. u3 dot is uh, in each one of these, when this term is multiplied by u1 and this term is multiplied by u2, there are two variable terms. There is this S4, which has time derivative and U1, and also there is C4 and U2. So you're going to get four terms, and these are those four terms, as you can see. And now in these terms, uh, or actually um, in each one of them, there, is, there are two terms, right? So there are four terms here. Now what I did was the U1 dot and the U2 dot, I wrote them here right you can see this one and this one are written here and then the other terms which carry a q4 dot i separately factored them out here good now what now i can do something for this q4 dot because q4 dot if we go back and look q4 dot is what it's negative u2 plus what u3 so you see here i replaced it and what is u3? Well, u3, there is a formula for it as a function of u1 and u2. So now this one is going to come right sit there. And if you replace, now look at this equation 5. This is u3 dot in terms of only u1 and u2 and what their time derivatives. So you see, if I use equations 4 and 5, anywhere I have a u3 or a u3 dot, I can get rid of it. I can simply replace it. Yes? Good. So now that the constraint is uh, basically taken care of by elimination, now it's time to go through steps of the Keynes method. So the first step is to find the required linear and angular velocities and their partial velocities. So first, let's go ahead and find the actual linear and angular velocities. Okay, and then we go through the table to find the partials. But first, which points do we need to find V and omega for? Well, the first point we need is point BO. Why BO? Because BO is a point that... Uh, Basically, the uh, inertial term, the inertial acceleration term of A of B O is going to be needed. So we need the V of B O, so we can take a time derivative of that and get A of B O later. So definitely, V of B O is a needed term, okay, as we'll see. The next term is P3. Why P3 is important? Okay, why is that P3 is important? Because if we go and look later on, one of the things we need is A of P3. Well, why A of P3 is needed? Because P3 has a mass to it, has mass MC. It's at location P3. So the acceleration uh, here of P3 is important so we can multiply it by m of c and get that generalized uh, um, active uh, for or generalized inertial force so we also need what we also need v of p3 so we can take a time derivative of that and get a of p3 
Yes? Okay, is there anything else that we need? Let's do a little bit fast cleanup. Okay, so the points that the masses are concentrated, here MB is concentrated, here MC is concentrated, so we need them. Is there anything else? Yes. What is that? That is this term here, IB. There is a uh, rotation inertia here, and so uh, for an inertia term, for a, um, a rotational inertia term, we also need to calculate what? We also need to calculate the alpha of that rigid body, alpha of B, for which we need what? We need omega of B to take a time derivative. Okay, we need to find what? We need to find omega of B, and that's what we need here. Omega of what? We need omega of this member B. This omega of B is needed, so we can get alpha of B. So we need three velocity terms and take derivative to get the acceleration term. So let's go ahead and find them. So first, what is velocity of point BO? Well, BO and point P1 belong to the same rigid body. You can see here that BO and P1 belong to the same rigid body. So velocity of BO is velocity of P1, which if you remember, it was U1 in the B1 direction, plus this length, which is L1, right multiplied by this u2 or omega of b in this direction which is b2 so it's going to be u1 in b1 plus l1 u2 in b2 right from rigid body kinematics that is exactly what i have here velocity of p3 is already calculated remember we calculated up there so here we have it and uh, the only thing is, remember, we don't need to uh, leave any U3 or its derivative behind. So now I try to get rid of its U3 by bringing this equation number 4 and replacing it. So now V of P3 is only written in terms of U1 and U2 and no U3 in it. And finally, omega of member B is, of course, U2 in the N3 direction or in the B3 direction. Okay? So now I found what? I found my three important velocities. Now that I know my velocities, I need to find the partial of these velocities. So here is V of um, point BO, this is V of point P3, and this is omega of B. Now here in this table, you see one extra thing is added, and that is V of P1. And you might say, why V of P1 is needed? What is the importance of V of P1? Because uh, these three terms were needed for inertial terms. These are needed for FR stars. They will be used in FR star. What about this? What about this guy? This one is the place where the external what? The external torque and the external force are applied. So when we go to the active forces, FR, not FR star, when we go to FR, we need what? We need V of point P1 to be dot producted by the force and omega of member B to be dot producted by the torque. So V of P1 is also what? Important. And so... If you want, we can add one extra equation here for V of P1. And what was V of P1? You are right. It was just B1 times U1, that first term here and here. So here I added that equation and I renumbered my equation to reflect this one. So we have four important what velocity terms. And now we need to find their partial components since we only have two real degrees of freedom left u1 and u2 so we only need r1 and r2 so we write them for rows and for columns we have these four important entities and how do we find now these partial velocities we look at the coefficients of u1 and u2 so wherever multiplied by uh, u1 and whatever multiplied by u2 they go to this column here 
So if you look at V of P1, it has B1 for U1, nothing for U2, so you get a B1 and a 0. If you look at velocity of point BO, it has a B1 for U1 and then an L1, B2 for U2, so that's B1 and L1, B2. If you look at velocity of 3, then if you look at the simplified version where U3 is gone, so... Um, you look at that, then for U1, you have B1 plus S for C2, and for U2, we have L2B1 uh, minus L2C uh, for C2, and that is this guy. And finally, for omega of um, B, the thing we have is uh, basically U2B3, so no U1, 0 for U1, U2, for U2 is B3, and this is what you have here. Next, we have to calculate the acceleration terms, and the acceleration terms are uh, quite big too. So, uh, if you look here, there are three terms that we need to do acceleration for. A at point B, O, and then uh, A at point P3, and finally what? Alpha of member B. So what we need to do is to take time derivative from equations 7, 8, and 10, which are V of uh, BO, V of P3, and omega of B. We have to take derivative from these three equations, which if we do here, this is V of BO. If we take time derivative, be very careful that not only U1 and U2 have time derivative, B1 and B2 also have time derivative. These are rotating unit vectors, so their time derivatives is omega of the frame they are attached to, which in this case omega of B cross themselves. So these guys that you see, these are the time derivatives, the ones underlined. These are the time derivatives of B1 and B2, plus, of course, uh, these B and B1 and B2 times U1 dot and U2 dot. Okay, and then for omega of b, we bring it from the top here. It was u to b3. So we plug it here, as you can see, u to b3. So we get b3 cross b1, which is b2, and then b3 cross b2, which is negative b1. So we get these guys. Okay, and clearly here, this is a square term. So if you want, you can what? You can uh, simplify this and write it like that. So equation 11 is the acceleration of point BO for point B3, P3. You have to take time derivative of this one, V of P3, and here you even have more derivatives. B1 has time derivative, U1 does, U2 does, B2 does, U3 does, and C2 does. Okay, so these are the time derivative of those unit vectors. For C2, since it's attached to frame C, we have to cross multiply omega of c by that and remember omega of c is what omega of c is u3 times n3 okay or if you want to write it in terms of the c frame you can write it what you can write it as u3 times what times c3 if you would like you can write it that way and then bring it down and then uh, plug it in now, one thing you have to pay attention to is this U here, which will generate U3 dot. Then both for that U3 and the U3 dot, you have to bring in equations 4 and 5, which were for U and its time derivative, right? Look back here. Equation 4 is for uh, U and equation 5 was what? For U dot. So you have to bring this equation and replace wherever you see U3 and bring this guy and replace U3 dot wherever you see that. So expect some large term for the final A of P3. And you see this is the final answer if you plug in everything. The whole big of a thing. Okay. And uh, this one was... A of B O and finally alpha of member B is simply derivative of U2 with respect to B3, which is U2 dot B3. Now in this case you might say B3 also has a time derivative. 
Uh, in this case, B3 is always out of the board. So B3 does not have a time derivative. The derivative of that is zero. So alpha of member uh, B is only U2 dot B3. Now that I have these A's and alphas, I can calculate my generalized inertial forces. How? This is the inertial force for the acceleration of centroid BO. Right, you see mass of B is multiplied by acceleration of B O in N and then dot product from uh, behind by what? By velocity of B O and of course the R index for all of these. For uh, the uh, linear acceleration, the inertial term of uh, MC times A of PC, of course velocity of point PC should be dot producted. And then here is the new term that I mentioned this is the uh, inertial term due to rotation, I times alpha. For linear accelerations, the inertial term is M times A with a negative sign, but for a rotation term is negative I times alpha. So you see alpha of member B is multiplied by I of member B about the centroid with a negative sign. So this is the inertial rotation term and pre dot multiplied by what? By omega of member B. Okay, and then you have to expand it one time for R of 1, one time for R of 2, which you, if you do, there will be a bunch of dots, a, that, a bunch of time derivatives, because these accelerations and velocities have to come from which equations? They have to come from equations, basically the A's are coming from 11, 12, 13, and the V's are coming from what? From 7, uh, 9, and 10. So you have to combine 7, 9, 10, right? With what? With 11, 12, 13. So you can calculate F star 1 and F star 2. So they're going to be some big terms here. This is just a general format. You have to expand it one time for R of 1, one time for R of 2. And the active generalized forces are, as we said, the force FB1 is applied at what? At point P1, so we dot producted by VP1. And the torque tau is uh, applied on member B, so we dot producted by omega of B. And now we have V of P1 and omega B1 in the velocity section. We have them here and here. And these can be generally considered as their own components, right? So here we, again, we need to do some dot product and then one time for R of 1, one time for R of 2. So we get F1, F2. Here we get F1 star, F2 star. And once we get them, set of equations 16 and 17 can be calculated for the star forces. Okay, so these are the simplified F1 star and F2 star. And then uh, F1 and F2 are very simple. They are simply just F and tau. Okay, and then we say F1 plus F1 star 0, F2 plus F2 star equals 0, right? The two uh, equations, and if you do so, these two are your final governing equations. Okay, where clearly you can see the um, uh, centripetal terms here, and you see the uh, Coriolis terms here. Okay, and these are the acceleration terms. Yes, so both accelerations appear in both of the equations. If you want them independently, then, and here there is a U3. So really, if you want it here, this U3 here is not final simplified. This U3 has to be simplified by basically this guy there. Okay, this is your um, U3 that has to be simplified there so this is not like the ultimate one right as well as here you see there is what some u3 so if you want you can further uh, simplify to only u1 and u2 and since i want to give you clean nice final equations here we go i replace the u3 squared for you so these are what these are your final equations only in terms of u1 and u2 and u1 dot and u2 dot and again if you know f and tau 
then you can solve for the uh, u dot and u1 dot and u2 dot here in writing it as a times x equal b which is the forward dynamics or if you know u1 u2 u1 dot u2 dot and you need to find the forces and the torques that you need then you can do inverse dynamics problem but you see that even a shopping cart with a simple caster wheel the equations of motion for it because it has four dofs and two constraints or ultimately two dofs they are not as simple as you think to derive even with the Keynes equations okay so hopefully this video was useful to you because students in my class they ask me to uh, derive the equations of motion either using Newton method or Lagrangian or Kane for systems with higher degrees of freedom or at least uh, with some constraints so the ones that are more complicated than the simple what the simple 2DOF planar arm which we always do and most textbooks do so if you are after something more complicated this could be what a good example for you and remember the most important things is uh, here shown is elimination of degrees of freedom and the other thing is if you have a rigid body not a point mass for it you need to consider what a um, rotational inertia term as well in the f star okay so Thank you so much for your attention. I'll see you in the next lecture.